a Netflix original film. The Wi-Fi is working. In the event of a global communications breakdown, do the following. Stay inside. What just happened here is happening everywhere. Avoid strangers. We've all been deserted. I don't trust them. And most importantly, do not panic. Julia Roberts. What happens next? Mahershala Ali. I knew something was coming. Leave the world behind. Rated R. In select theaters now and on Netflix December 8th. Today on CityCast Chicago, the city begins construction on a temporary migrant shelter in Brighton Park. The Chicago Housing Authority is sitting on hundreds of vacant properties. And have y'all seen all them fancy cabbages planted in the loop and around the city? We talking about that and more with our friends from Block Club Chicago, reporters Madison Saavedra and Melody Mercado. It's Friday, December 1st. I'm Jacoby Cochran, and this is what Chicago is talking about. morning madison how you doing today i'm doing good it's december it's my favorite month of the year that makes you a looney tune my dog that (laughs) makes you a looney tune by yourself melody let's kick it over to you how you feeling today i'm feeling good i agree with you i hate december (laughs) (laughs) i love we get started off on the right foot a couple of uh december loathers and then one person somehow is out here just excited for us to be in uh to one of the the coldest months of the year but hey you know we still got love for you here on citycast matter so we still got love for you uh this week we've got some big stories to talk about across the chicago land area but let's start with a little bit of joy right this is the week that the music apps we love to listen to namely spotify and apple music started to le- release their spotify rap and their apple music replay 23 where they show you some of the biggest names albums songs that you listen to across 2023 uh Basically, it's the time when people pretend that they didn't listen to Drake nearly as much as they did because the numbers, the numbers don't lie. Madison, I'm going to start with you. When you went to your Spotify rap, what did it say about you? Who were your top artists, your albums? My top artists were completely not a surprise. I, I'm, I'm basic. I'll just I'm going to lead with that. I'm basic. <laughs> I love pop music. I am a teenage girl at heart. My top artist is Taylor Swift. OK, she's been my top artist for uh, years. <laughs> <laughs> Followed by uh, Lana Del Rey, Miley Cyrus, Harry Styles, Olivia Rodrigo. It really doesn't get any more basic than that. But I love it. <laughs> no, I love that for you. Melody, what about you? What did your uh, top five artist songs and albums look like this year? So if anything, I'm very consistent. Uh, my top <laughs> uh, my top artist of the year was BTS. I'm a huge BTS fan. Absolutely love that. <laughs> Can confirm. <laughs> My so then my second person was RM, a member of BTS. They all have solo projects and solo albums. So then sandwich in the middle was Bad Bunny. I love Bad Bunny, but we are kind of going through a breakup stage. I haven't been super happy with some of his decisions recently, but whatever. Then at number four, we have J Hope, also from BTS. And then at number five, we have Suga, also from BTS. <laughs> so I'm a you mega said, I, fan. I, I support the group. I support I my support boys. The, you, the individual careers. <laughs> I got y'all. If there are five fans, I'm one of them. If it's two fans, I'm one of them. If it's one, is me. And if they're none, I'm gone. Exactly. So I am that girl. <laughs> I love that for both of y'all though, because now y'all the the Spotify rap sound like they've been consistent for a few years, just sort of reinforcing what you already know. Uh, me, I think for the second year in a row, my top artist hails from Chicago, and it was Mick Jenkins. He dropped one of my favorite albums of the year, The Patience, and it's gotten, according to uh, to my chart, the album has got 116 plays. Uh, throughout 2023. And so we got a little bit of something to everybody here. We got something for the Swifties, for the pop folks who want a little Lana Del Rey. We got some folks for the K-pop fans or some people want a little Benito. And, and, and we got some local Chicago with Mick Jenkins. Um, and then my other album was was from Cleo Soul. That's the one that probably got a lot of play. Like you ever catch me in a gym and it seems like I'm struggling. I'm just listening to some very relaxed Cleo Soul <laughs> in the headphones. Nothing, not, no, no Yachty, just a little Cleo. You know, for people who are new to City Cash Chicago, every Friday we bring on some friends to talk about this, this, the stories that were happening in our city. But what I love about our Friday recap is we ask y'all 
to bring the stories y'all want to talk about. And a big one this week was confusion about the city's ongoing plan to provide shelter for the nearly 23,000 new arrivals to Chicago in just uh, the last year and some change. Uh, Right now, we've got over 1,200 migrants who are still sleeping inside, outside or near police stations or at O'Hare Airport. And since October, Mayor Brandon Johnson has floated this plan to create these sort of large winterized tent base camps that can house potentially thousands of migrants. One of them was set to be built in Brighton Park. But Madison, this week was hella confusing, G, because we started on Monday and I was hearing from multiple sources. It will start today. It won't start today. Tuesday, people were there, but that wasn't official construction. Then Wednesday, maybe. Okay, so you're here. What's going on with Brighton Park? Can you can you catch a, a city cast folks up? Absolutely. You are definitely right on saying it was hella confusing because everyone was saying something different. And I think at the root of this issue is kind of an issue of semantics. What are we considering construction? Because there have been crews working on the site for days and there have been city departments doing assessments for weeks. So Monday, the local alderwoman, Julia Ramirez of the 12th Ward, she was under the impression construction was going to start Monday. She put this out in an open letter over the weekend to her constituents. The city said, nope, it's not happening Monday. It's happening in the future, but they couldn't or wouldn't commit to what day it was happening. And then you're absolutely right. Tuesday, there are trucks out there, gravels down on the site. I guess that's not considered construction though. Fast forward to Wednesday, there are structures being built our colleague Colin Boyle at Block Club Chicago, he was down there at the site taking some really great photographs of the tent structures being built. And I mean, it's it's the outline of a tent. Um, so I think it's safe to say that that's construction. Uh, that is ongoing. It's not super clear how long that's going to take. There was a city fact sheet that was passed out at a community meeting I was at in late October. That had said it would take at least four days for that to be rapidly constructed. I'm not entirely sure if that's outdated information considering that was passed out in October, but everything has to be built and it has to be checked and everything before residents could move in. Madison, I got to ask, has there not been some sort of deal made available to the ward, similar to what we saw with Ronnie Mosley's ward on the far south side, right? They wanted to put one of these camps on 115th and Halsted. The neighbors pushed back, the alder pushed back, but they were able to secure some type of deal where it says after a year, the city will help them rapidly begin construction on a development complex there. What does that conversation look like in Brighton Park? What what do the alders in the community want? Is it as simple as no base camp or, or is there some maybe deal to be made here? If there is a deal that people want, it hasn't really been made known to me. I think one difference between these two sites, that far south side one and the Brighton Park one, is that the Brighton Park land is privately owned. It's owned by a company called the Sanchez Group. They were the ones who made this land available. Great point. There really isn't any public right in this. You know, as as frustrating as that might be for people, it's not it's not their land. It's not necessarily public land. It doesn't have plans for public use the way the far south side uh, site, you know, it's earmarked for a future development that residents have been looking forward to for quite a while. So I think that is one key component. And then kind of like you said, the older woman, she doesn't have any control over that. You know, it's privately owned. She didn't suggest it. Um, it's not like the mayor said, is it okay if we do this? Uh, you know, they're, <laughs> they're acting under emergency powers. You know, the state of emergency that's been declared by the governor, it gives the city the ability to kind of bypass zoning laws, you know, places that aren't necessarily zoned for shelters, They don't need to be because they're acting with this emergency declaration. Melody, you've been covering this, right? Every single ward, every single neighborhood has been impacted around the conversation of where can we possibly provide shelter for for thousands upon thousands of of new arrivals, people who don't speak the language, people who are looking for work authorizations, people who might be trying to get their kids into schools. And this week, Mayor Brandon Johnson stepped out with some of the city's most notable faith leaders, right? Father Flager from St. Sabina, uh, you know, Reverend Jesse. Jackson and the Push Coalition to to try to bring faith organizations here. First, I want to ask, 
recently, what has the attempt to, to bring shelter to some of the areas you covered downtown, the loop, the West loop looked like, and, and also can you talk a little bit about what maybe the, these church services, these buildings can provide people in the meantime? Yeah, I think speaking immediately to, you know, the downtown and the West loop area, providing shelter for migrants has looked like private building owners that have sat with vacant properties for years, some of them that have been on the market and just haven't sold, um, have been marketing their buildings to the city to have a paying tenant. And this has resulted in, we've seen it across the city, but primarily in downtown and the West Loop of these large office buildings that have um, sort of gone new life as a migrant shelter and have leases locked in through uh, next year. Um, And the local aldermen uh, have have expressed very vocally that they are not involved in this process. They want to be looped in. They have no idea when shelter sites come online. And that's been very frustrating for them. And I think it's kind of interesting um, to see these these aldermen sort of be as vocal about it because you can you can tell that they don't like the sense of losing control over what's going on in their wards. And it's 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 becoming super noticeable with Alderman Riley, Alderman Hopkins, Alderman Conway, you know, Alderman Burnett to an ex- to to an extension as well. Um, they have very much said, you know, we want to be looped in. We don't want to find out the day before that something is coming into our ward that we don't want necessarily, or maybe it's not a good fit for the area or whatever it might be. I think bringing faith leaders into the mix is showing that the city is sort of desperate in a way to move these migrants out of police stations. Um, We have seen that people have been sleeping outside and it is winter and Chicago winter is very brutal. Um, And I think that the administration, you know, the base camp is obviously not ready. We have people sleeping outside. We have people sleeping at police stations. Sometimes they can't stay inside the police stations during the day. So they're outside or going to warming centers. The city needs a plan to move people immediately and tapping faith leaders is a way to do it uh, probably a little bit more economically. And again, we know that there are some, uh, there's private money being brought into this to be able to carry this out. I think the only thing uh, that we're still scratching our heads at is that the city hasn't told us where any of these churches are, exactly um, <laughs> where they are, who the, who the churches are going to be. You know, I think that's really important because one thing about Chicago is if you scratch my back, I scratch yours. People want to know, people want to know like who these pastors are. Are they connected? You know, yes, they are helping people, but also at the same time. Will money be changing hands? Exactly. Will money be exchanging hands? Are they getting money to, you know, house these migrants? Um, and is the city going to make sure that it's being done properly? I mean, Madison, obviously there is no timetable for this, particularly in terms of when we'll see the numbers of, of new arrivals starting to dip, maybe even sort of a, a, a softening. But but the city, it's, it still feels all of these months later, just feels behind the eight ball, just responding to crisis after crisis after crisis. With the amount of time you've been covering this and the news we got this week, does it feel like the city is maybe getting a better grasp over this? They've gotten some new money from the state. They've got a plan for one or two of these major camps. They're bringing in faith leaders. Does it feel like they're starting to get a hold over this? I think some people could argue that, yes, we are seeing a bit of a turning of the page. Every day the city releases its daily census, like so numbers of how many new arrivals there are total, whether they're in city-run shelters or in police stations or at O'Hare. And it has steadily been going down, down, down every day for the past couple of weeks. We saw a similar shift this time last year, like November, December, bus arrivals kind of started to trickle. and you know, obviously people weren't staying in police stations last year. They were staying in shelters and then, you know, figuring out their own housing situations. But I do think we're seeing a little bit of something different. And now with these churches, I just want to say there have been churches that have been taking in, uh, you know, migrants and refugees 
not only through this entire crisis, but for years. Prior to it. They, yeah. They've been doing this as helping resettle Chicago migrant families for decades. Totally. And so I just think maybe having this kind of city sanctioned, um, you know, I think it does show some ingenuity. Uh, however, to Melody's point, I do think that the transparency here is important. The city wasn't super clear. Um, when they first started opening city shelters, they kind of kept those hush hush as well. And I get it for reasons of like privacy and security. Um, but also, you know, we want to make sure that everything is happening, you know, above the board, there is no kind of to Melody's point, people scratching each other's backs for possibly nefarious reasons. Not saying that's happening. But if nobody knows, then, you know, people just make assumptions. <laughs> If we're going to be talking about housing, then we probably should also be talking about the Chicago Housing Authority, the agency which owns property in every Chicago ward and serves it through various programs, nearly 63,000 households, according to reports. Uh, and they've got over 200,000 people on their waiting list. I appreciate some of our colleagues who have said this is not a migrant crisis. In the same way, we do not have sort of a homelessness crisis. We have an affordable housing crisis. We don't have enough housing available for the vulnerable populations living in our city or the vulnerable populations arriving to our city. And the Chicago Housing Authority, for all practical purposes, their job is to provide affordable housing opportunities to the people who need them. Melody, when I asked you what the stories you want to talk about today, you said, you know, CHA being a hot mess. Can you catch up CityCast listeners on the recent investigation from your colleagues at Block Club? Yes. Yeah, so um, I, I, I was excited to finally see this come out because I know our team has been working very hard on this for some time. Basically, the investigation found uh, that the CHA has about 500 scattered sites across the city that are vacant and are extremely dilapidated if i'm saying that word right but and it, it not only that is some of these houses are deteriorating to a point where it's causing serious issues with neighbors and the neighborhood um in terms of safety and just overall like why isn't this home being taken care of why isn't there someone in it that's been on the list for x amount of years and has been waiting for for you know affordable housing I was just kind of shocked looking at the map that was provided and you can see sort of the the vacancy rates um, and the unit counts across the city. You know, immediately what caught my eye is that a lot of these are short, sort of on the near west side um, and some uh, that are highly concentrated in parts of the south side. But how frustrating would it be to see a vacant home that that's maybe on your block and it's falling apart? And there's no one's been taking care of it for years. And then you find out that it belongs to an agency <laughs> that could be doing something about it and they haven't been doing anything about it. How frustrating is that? Now, it, it, it's extremely because, I mean, the, the investigation from Block Club and the Illinois Answers Project hits it on the head at the beginning, right? Like CHA has made a ton of promises over the last century, right? From, uh, you know, building up one of the largest uh, public housing divisions in the country for laying the blueprint for providing public housing. So then, and within 20, 30 years, a lot of those are abandoned and deteriorated. The people there are sort of left to their own devices. The federal government comes in and is like, hey, you need to do better. Spread these out. You've concentrated them in Black communities. What's CHA do? We're just going to stop building, right? They they stop building these, these public high rises and switch to this sort of scattered site model, which basically says, that CHA is going to own properties around the city from small to, to sort of mid-sized apartment buildings to single family homes. And those will be the affordable housing opportunities provided. I've, I've heard for years that sitting on CHA's wait list is, is purgatory. You can be there for five, six, 10 years. And then you read this investigation and people are like, yeah, I sat on it for 10 years and then I found a space, but other uh, apartments in my building are completely abandoned. You have people who've been on the list looking for housing, and then they find out 
Oh, well, well, there are a close to 500 properties, but they've just sort of been left in disarray. And CHA has promised at different points over the last few years that, hey, we're going to invest more money in fixing these up. We're going to provide more rental programs. And, and then, like you said, Melody, you see this map and, you know, residents have been complaining for years and years that well, this stuff is just sort of sitting in our neighborhoods, causing one of many problems. Oh, if I was somebody on the CHA waiting list reading this investigation, I'd I'd be pissed. I'd be like, mm-hmm. oh my God, you've had me on this list for X amount of months, years, and you're sitting on this property. And I, I can imagine that it is expensive to fix up some of these. You know, the price of all the materials required to fix up homes has only it has only gone up since the pandemic. Um, so if anything, it would have been cheaper to do it five, ten years ago. Um, so I I can I can sympathize with that, I suppose. However, there was also a bit of uh, passing the buck. You could say this CHA didn't really make anyone available to interview, like my uh, colleagues at Block Club or the folks at Illinois Answers Project. They sent over a couple statements, and you know those were included in the story. And it was a lot of that. This is the responsibility of the management companies. That like, okay, it's the management companies, right? These scattered sites. Uh, they they hire these private managers. Yep. Yeah, they're managed by different people. I think the CHA's biggest point was that if this building is falling apart, then like, oh my gosh, like that's the management company's fault. Well, did get a new management company. I'm so, I'm so confused. And some of these buildings have had multiple management companies, and, and they've seen no changes. It's hard. Then you look and you dive into the numbers deeper, and you and you hear right. You see those statements that CHA says it's on the managers, on the managers, but the numbers say otherwise. Because since 1999, when CHA launched their infamous plan for devastation, as I like to call it, right, they 522 of the 2,900 sites were vacant. That's 18 percent. Right. 24 years later, they only got 2,800 sites, but 17 percent of those are vacant. So, right, they, they, you, you want to blame the pandemic, you want to blame inflation, you want to blame economic downturns, you want to blame, like, whatever you want to talk about, your numbers have not changed for a quarter of a century. I know, Melody, you said you were excited to see this investigation. Your colleagues have been working on it. But apparently, CHA also knew it was coming because earlier this week, they announced a program to finally, out of nowhere, wow. renovate part of its uh, its holdings called Restore Home. What does what CHA say their plan is, uh, Melody? So CHA announced that they have this new $50 million program. And what do you know? They're going to be, quote, laser focused over the next 18 months to focus on vacant single family homes and smaller apartment buildings, which is exactly what our colleagues wrote about. Um, and this was this this whole plan was released uh, like two days before our story mm-hmm. went out. Um, so, you know, the timing is very suspect, but does they're going to be they're going to start doing it. They said they're going to uh, do repairs and in some cases, gut rehabs for 217 housing units and 77 buildings, including 36 small to midsize apartment buildings. Uh, and they're going to do uh, some work on some single family homes that they hope to sell as well. So obviously we know. Like maybe not from personal experience or anything, but the idea of rehabbing homes, fixing up a home or an apartment building that's infested with rats or raccoons or been vacant for decades. One, that's your problem. You should have been on that. But two, I can understand that takes a long time. But now I'm hearing $50 million in 18 months and we might be able to put a dent into this. The next 18 months are going to be revolutionary. (laughs) Right. But apparently the next 18 months is just going to change lives. It's going to provide housing for hundreds of people. Again, for this to come out, Two days before an investigation looking into the exact thing, while on at the same time, 23,000 people have arrived trying to seek, uh, trying to get asylum. Uh, the rent, the rising rents and mortgages have not dipped in the last 18 months. The, the number of unhoused Chicagoans have, are now going into their second winter, right, in terms of an 18 month span. So, yeah, the timing of this, uh, while I I am going, we're all going to hold them accountable. Is this a promise that CHA actually keeps? We'll see. Uh, But yeah, that that timing doesn't look good at all, G. At all. Every single episode of CityCast Chicago ends with some good news. 
news. This could be something personal, something professional, an event you're looking forward to, just something that has you excited and will likely get the CityCast listeners excited as well. Madison, let's start with you. What's your some good news for the people today? I've got some good news for Chicagoans who like to run in the cold. Uh, this is some local news from my... The five people you are talking <laughs> to, ears perked up. <laughs> this is some local news in my beat in Pilsen. There's a Pilsen resident uh, who is organizing her own little 5K run uh, December 10th at 9 a.m. She's kicking off this 5K. Her name is Alejandra from the Venezuelan-owned cafe. It's called Mandala Cafe uh, on 18th Street in Pilsen. The race is free, and it's it's not like a super official thing. Like roads won't be closed or anything. It'll just take place, you know, depending on how many folks on the sidewalk, maybe in waves. Uh, but the idea is to raise some donations for migrants who might still be sleeping in police stations uh, or, you know, trying to build some lives for themselves and their maybe their own permanent housing. Um, so people are encouraged to bring gently used or new winter clothes. Or Alejandra has an Amazon wish list uh, that's linked in my story on the on the race, so people could buy brand new things that'll get shipped straight to Alejandra. Um, and I just think that this is a great example of how creative and thoughtful and kind and generous some Chicagoans are. There's so much bad and heartbreaking news about you know this situation, and I just think that this is one silver lining. This woman, she loves to run. She is from Colombia herself. Uh, she thought of a way that she could make a difference, and she's making it happen. And I am truly in awe of her. And if I didn't have a bum knee right now, I would be doing the 5K. <laughs> <laughs> Madison, I have a bum knee too, so we might just have to go cheer him on. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, feel better. Uh, I'm really grateful for your coverage. Melody, come on in here. You seem to be here right before you go on a vacation every single time. And so I know you got a, uh, got a one-two punch for us today. What is your some good news? Truly plural. I am going to Puerto Rico next week. I am very excited. Tell Bad Bunny I say um, hi. <laughs> I, I will. I will. I will be looking out for him. Um, for people that don't know, I am Puerto Rican, in case you can't tell. And I try to go to Puerto Rico every year. And I think December is the best time to go because uh, Puerto Rico, like Puerto Ricans love Christmas um so much our christmas season starts november 1st like there is no thanksgiving thanksgiving is like pre-christmas and then we have christmas and then we have three king's day so it's like three christmases um and the island is really in a big festive spirit and everything is really decorated and there's something about christmas decorations and on like a tropical island that just kind of make it a little bit nicer because i'm not in the cold. Right. Um, so I'm, ve I'm very excited to go and see some family and uh, hang out on the beach and do nothing. I do got one more. So I love this story because I see this all the time. But if you look closely, you will notice that a lot of public spaces and planters, um, they're decorated with vegetables. They It's like different types of cabbages, kale, um, and like sometimes lettuce okay like in planters in downtown or just across the city planters in downtown across the city it's a very popular with landscapers to use these types of vegetables because they are very hardy and can withstand like winter weather um but i've always just kind of wondered like is this purposeful like where do these go afterwards can you eat them you know all these questions mm -hmm. don't be bringing your farmer's market totes out there because you cannot eat these it's highly recommended that you don't pick them and take them home because you know they are very big and luscious and colorful but part of that reason is because they uh the growers that that typically grow these will use like incesticides and pesticides. They genetically modified up in there. Yeah. To make sure they stay looking pretty. Um, and also, you know, Chicago is like a concrete jungle. There's lots of things running around. I don't think you'd want to be eat that anyways. Um, but they are very beautiful and good news. They are co usually composted afterwards, which makes me happy. So we're not just wasting plants or vegetables. I love that. I didn't know that. You just taught me something new. We got three 
great pieces of good news thus far. And I'm going to finish us out because today is World AIDS Day and a commemoration will be taking place this morning at the Chicago AIDS Garden in Lakeview, uh, right off the lakefront at Belmont Avenue. Uh, Chicagoans will come together at the AIDS Garden, which, if you don't remember, was finished, I believe, in June of last year. And it is a public space for people to memorialize and to remember the the thousands of Chicagoans who have lost their life um, uh, to AIDS over the last uh, four decades plus. According to the World Health Organization, World's AIDS Day is an opportunity to reflect on the progress made today, raise awareness about the challenges that remain to achieve the goals of ending AIDS by 2030. But also, I think it's an important time to remind ourselves, right, that our government, was in many ways very complicit during this crisis, turning their back on thousands of Chicagoans, folks around the country and around the world as this crisis was going on. This is just an opportunity for Chicagoans to participate. If you can today, uh, there are other ways around the city. So check the link in our show notes. I want to give another huge thank you to our guest today, uh, the dynamic duo from Block Club Chicago. Shout out to Melody Mercado and Madison Savage for sharing y'all stories, y'all music, and of course, y'all some good news hopefully y'all join us real soon yes thank you so much for having us thank you so much always a pleasure my friends Before we let you go, I just want to give a huge thank you to the people who make City Cash Chicago possible. That's executive producer Simone Alisea, our producer Michelle Navarro, our newsletter editor Sydney Madden, our roving producer is Dylan Brogan. The music we all love is from Sam Thousand, all the kimonos, and Mark Greenberg from the Mayfair Workshop. Of course, my last and my biggest thank you is for you, the people who listen to City Cash Chicago on regular speed and two times speed. Hopefully, you'll join us on Monday because we will be back. In the meantime, in between time, save our number in your phone, 773 780 0246. And between now and Monday, if you come up with an episode idea, go on and text it to us. Leave us a voicemail your name, your neighborhood, and your idea, and you may hear yourself on the podcast. I'm going to talk to you on Monday. Peace.